It's January 2020, and this is the Wow Signal Podcast, episode 44. And it is also the Wow Signal Live, episode 1, the audio version. Now, if you want to see the full Wow Signal Live, it's on YouTube. I have a link in the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com. As always, for more information, please go to wowsignalpodcast.com, where you can find the show notes for this episode and all the others. For our very first Wow Signal Live, we have as a special guest astronomer and director of the American Association of Variable Star Observers, Stella Kafka. Now, Stella has been on the Wow Signal before. She was on in 2016 to talk about Voyage and Star, what we called it Tabby Star back then. And she told us about how the AAVSO observes stars like that and keeps track of their light curves and other similar things. And I'll have a link to that in the show notes as well. But we invited her back because of all the excitement lately about the star Betelgeuse. Now, as you're about to hear, um, some of the press coverage you have seen is a little exaggerated or uh, perhaps a little over-dramatized, but Betelgeuse has been gotten a lot dimmer in the sky in the last 120 days or so. I suggest you go out and have a look at it and see if you can remember what it looked like before. It was, it's always been a nice bright red star in the constellation Orion, and I'll even put a little star chart in the show notes so you can see where to look for Betelgeuse. Uh, this time of year, it's not hard to find. Now, in uh, warmer months, it's often, in the Northern Hemisphere, it's often, uh, you have to get up early in the morning to see it, but here, right now, it's there in the, in the regular evening hours. Stella was kind enough to agree to appear on this first WOW Signal Live. Now, the live part worked technically, but it didn't go that well in terms of people asking questions live. And that's partly my fault for not doing a better job of publicizing it. I will try to make that more obvious and give people more lead time in the future. And we'll also do more of these in the evening in the USA, so people can uh, will not be at work when it's, when it's time to ask questions. So that's the main reason for doing it live, is that the audience can directly interact with the guest and, and the panel and ask questions. Uh, typically, we prefer people ask them on Discord, but you can also, there's other ways to get your question in and ideally live. And, and in some cases, we will even invite you in to the Zoom conference and you can ask your question right there. Um, so by all means, if you're interested in the future and asking questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. You can always email us at wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com if you want more information. I would also like to point out that I have slightly edited the live version down to the audio version just to save time and to re- remove some redundant or unnecessary audio that just doesn't add anything to the conversation. This is recorded at about 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time on the 20th of January, 2020. Joining us, along with Stella Kafka, is Chiro Villa, his very first appearance on the WOW Signal, although you may remember Chiro from quite a few appearances on the Unseen podcast, which ended in 2018. Also, Joining us is our regular co-host, Daniela DePaulis, for this discussion about astronomy, variable stars, and citizen science. We are honored to have with us the director of the American, is it the uh, American uh, Amateur Variable Star Observers? Is that right? No, it's American Association of Variable Star uh, Observers. American Association of Variable Star Observers. There you go. Director Stella Kafka from Cambridge, Massachusetts. 
And uh, also joining me today is Chiro Villa from Florida. Yeah, hey, Paul. Uh, and uh, Daniela DePaulis, who's frequently a co-host on this podcast. Hi, Paul. How are everyone? And I, th- I thought it'd be great to have Dr. Kafka on to talk about some of the interesting variable stars that have been in the sky lately. Um, the big one in the news has been Betelgeuse, so we're certainly going to get to that. And the organization she directs has been observing a lot of these interesting stars, reporting their magnitudes and so on. And uh, we'll have her kind of explain how that works for a more general audience as well. And uh, then we'll uh, take any questions. Now, we're taking questions on Discord. And on Twitter, if you go to at Podcast Wow, you will see pinned to the top of our profile the, the link to Discord where you can go in and type in your question. And I'm monitoring that right now live. So if you have a question, I'll see it. And I'll relay it to Stella, and we'll have a. Uh, also, of course, any questions that Chiro and Daniela have. So let's get start with the basics. Stella, tell our audience kind of what your organization does and kind of how it works a little bit at a at a very simple level. Absolutely. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's actually a pleasure to be back, Paul, um, and talk to your audience again. It's uh, it's also a very exciting time for the AVSO because of Beetlejuice, which is the star of the season, apparently. So let me start by telling you that the reminding you actually that the AVSO was formed in 1911 from the Harvard Observatory when the then director of the Harvard Observatory gathered a group of amateur astronomers in order to take data for his project. So in in essence, we are the first amateur uh, professional citizen science collaboration that was formed exactly in order to do science, in order to help professional astronomers with their scientific projects. Since then, we have grown. Uh, it says American in the name. We are an international organization. We have members and observers from 56 different countries in the world. We have individuals who are sending us data or asking for data from all those countries. Um, we are a group of um, about 5,000 individuals all over the world who are interested in understanding some aspects of, um, of stellar variability. Um, Just reminding you that variable stars are stars whose brightness is changing in the night sky within timescales that we can observe from the Earth. Um, And these uh, these are stars that we can actually assess that are changing with means that we have, such as our eyes or uh, binoculars or looking through an eyepiece of a telescope or even a DSLR camera or a CCD camera and a telescope. So all means are being used in order to, um, to actually acquire data on these stars. Now, the very core of our program are our databases, one of which is the photometry database uh, that has data from more than a century on about 30,000 objects, variable objects, <clears throat> including exoplanets, including some of uh, active galactic nuclei, which technically are black holes, stellar remnants that are um, eating up everything around them. Um, and pretty much anything and everything that you can imagine from the brightest stars in the night sky to as faint as 17 magnitudes. And that's a a different discussion how we actually uh, select our targets. But as you mentioned right now, what is stealing the show is a star that we are all familiar with and we can see from the North and the Southern hemisphere. And it's been known to be up there and be variable for thousands of years. And uh, recorded uh, to be variable in the AVSO database for at least 130 years. And that's Beetlejuice, Alpha Orionis. Yeah. That, that's, uh, I've always found that a really easy star to find in the sky because mm-hmm. it's, so, it's so bright, it's so red. Yes. Uh, uh, and, of course, the Orion is the constellation almost anyone can recognize. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's the big hunter, right? Yeah, with the, the three stars in the belt and then uh, the, the red star and the and the blue white star on either side of it. Uh, That is uh, now what's going on with Beetlejuice. Have you, uh, I know you guys have been watching it almost every night. Yes. What's going on with Beetlejuice? Who knows what's going on with Beetlejuice? (laughs) Just joking. (laughs) Uh, So as I said, we have about 130 years of data uh, of Beetlejuice. So we have been observing this star for a long, long time. Um, Since it's one of the brightest in the night sky, 
the first observations were visual. People were looking at it uh, with their own eyes. And we know, if not anything else, that Betelgeuse is what we call a semi-regular variable star. So this is something that is showing some periodicity, but it's interrupted with irregularities. So it is not exactly a periodic star. It's not uh, a star that is doing the same thing again and again and again in a very regular way. Um, so far, analysis of that data has showcased that Betelgeuse has what we call a, a cycle, uh, about six year cycle. So every six years it brightens and it fades. Uh, but super opposed to that cycle, there is another, another cycle that is about 430 days long. Um, that is doing its own thing. And these cycles are because of the growth and um, fainting of big spots. Just imagine star spots, sunspots, yeah. but uh, similar, but not quite the same phenomena and much, much larger in uh -huh. extent on the surface of the star. So it has to do something with the, the convective cells on the surface of Betelgeuse, like the, the, integrated, the integrated convective cells. So... <clears throat> We know that Betelgeuse is going bright and fade, right? Mm -hmm. we, we know that it's dimming from time to time. We know that its brightness is not exactly constant. What's special about this particular fading is that this is the faintest we've ever observed it in our recorded history. Does this make wow. sense? Yeah. So suddenly dim for about a hundred years, in other words. Yeah, for about a, a recorded history, right? Um, yeah. So at least when when we're looking at our light curves, we're looking at our data. So we know that it's it can dim, and when it started dimming, yeah, sure, Betelgeuse is dimming, and then it kept dimming, and it kept dimming, and it kept dimming. Like, whoa, hold on, what is going on with Betelgeuse here? And this is where it became the the star of the season. This is where everybody got really excited, as in, you know. This is a star that everybody can see, even from downtown Boston, mm -hmm. which is kind of one of the most light polluted cities that I know. Uh, and still, if you're paying, if you're paying attention, if you're very familiar with it, you can see it being not so bright anymore with respect to other stars in the constellation. Yeah. It's, it's like our experience that makes it exciting. Yeah. Now, uh, astronomers do believe that someday, they don't know exactly when, Beetle just is going to go to supernova right and become extremely bright so uh, we know when it's within the next couple of thousands hundreds of thousands of years oh okay yeah, i'll just, put it on my I calendar <laughs> <laughs> i know right uh yeah but, uh, soon uh, in an astronomical sense right <laughs> but not in a human sense uh so yeah we don't the current the current dimming may have nothing to do with that right Exactly. So there, there are no models that um, gives any indicate give any indication that a dimming of a star of that uh, mass and that radius and that stellar evolution stage is connected with it becoming supernova. Right. I understand. So these are two things that are are sort of separate. Now, having said that, our models for this type of st stellar evolution are very hand wavy. They're very vague. Uh, remember, models are being driven by observations, and we have not observed the behavior of a star right before it became a supernova type two in in such detail to fit in our models. But there is no physical reason why this star should a star of of this kind of brightness and this kind of mass, sorry, uh, should dim before it goes kaboom. I mean, dim in the visual. Managers, and at least with the rate that we see in Betelgeuse. Oh, okay. But you guys are keeping an eye on it just in case, right? <laughs> oh, we're cer certainly keeping an eye. Do you know if it goes, uh, so when it goes supernova, we will all keep an eye on it. It will get brighter than the full moon in the night. Paul, you allow me for a quick question. <laughs> Tell us, is there any other possible, I don't know, um, phenomenon uh, uh, explanation for something like this to occur other than the variability, the intrinsic variability of the of the star itself? Could there be an extrinsic explanation in this case, in the case of Betelgeuse? Uh, extrinsic as in an other object? Well, yeah, like some sort of ob obfuscation happening. <clears throat> some sort. So the, the leading 
uh, the leading theory that has been proposed by a group from Villanova University and colleagues uh, is that pretty much, remember I told you that it has a 5.9 year or six year cycle, right? And then it has a 430 day cycle. Somehow those cycles coincided. Mm -hmm. So as a result of first cycle, you see a deeming every four hundred six years, right? As a result of the second cycle, you see a deeming every 430 days. Now, if you put them both together, then you'd see a deem and a deemer sort of phenomenon. So that is the leading theory right now. Um, having said that, in order to confirm that theory, we need to actually see that phenomenon being completed, recovering, and we need to see how it behaves over the next several years. So this is something TBD, right? You have a complete picture yet. I there you go. Not complete the curve. There you go. And that is why it's really very valuable to keep collecting data on this object. Now, uh, the reason actually why we notice that something like that is happening is because we already have data on this star, right? How many more, how many other stars similar to Betelgeuse might be showing this kind of behavior, but no one has data on them. So Betelgeuse can be actually the prototype of feeding into models of similar stars that would give us um, more information of how these stars evolve, how these stars progress uh, during a very interesting phase of their lives, just a couple of hundred of uh, thousands of years before they become supernova, right? which is just because. It's fascinating. I mean, it's obviously fascinating to to witness, if oh, yeah. else, something. Like, even man, I guess uh, it's interesting to see all the <laughs> speculation of the <laughs> community out there. It's kind of yeah. it's interesting yes. in itself. I well, guess. the headline writers always want to put in something That's like right. uh, exploding tomorrow. <laughs> star may explode. Uh, <laughs> Exploded well, tomorrow. of course, star, supernovas go off every day. We just, they're too far away to be visible to even I. But. but do you think this uh, possibility that it exploded is generating so much interest, not only amongst astronomers, but also amongst the general public? I've seen a really active and uh, very colorful conversation about this topic on the SETI community uh, mailing list. You said why? Yes. Why do you think it's generating so much cultural interest? I think that it has to do with the fact that we are witnessing something right now, something that we can see with our own eyes. Um, you know, in astronomy, as human beings, we are explorers, right? We explore nature around us. We try to figure out how things work. We love it when we, we find out how things work. We love it when they do something bizarre. And we love it how, when they do something extraordinary. Uh, think volcanoes going kaboom, right? We love when the catastrophe like this is happening. Uh, you know, human ramifications aside. With the universe, it's a little bit different. We get excited when we hear about the cosmic explosion. We hear, uh, get excited when we hear about detection of, you know, neutral star mergers, gravitational waves. But this is not exactly part of our everyday experience. It's not something that you or I can look at and say, oh, look, something happened. It changed. Betelgeuse is different because Betelgeuse is just 700 light years away. It's in our neighborhood. And Betelgeuse is a star that we know. This is a red star in the big hunter, Orion, right? And even if you take the simple kind of astronomy class, you will learn the constellations and Orion is one of the most prominent and easier to identify even from a city center. So at some point, it triggers people's imagination when you see this red star and somebody tells you that within the near future, quote unquote, astronomical future, it will go supernova. So you and I and everybody will get to witness a supernova. And you know, I really wish it was supernova, darn it, because I've never seen one of those. But you know, it's one of those things, it's, it's experiential. It's more of something that we get, we as, as common human beings without having any special detectors or access to sophisticated equipment could eventually be able to witness. And I think that this is one of the things that triggers people's imagination. There's also the wow factor. Think about um, how people are intrigued and amazed by a solar eclipse. It can be a very emotional experience for some. It can be a very exciting experience for others. Uh, or a solar, a, a lunar eclipse. You see the moon being covered in the red, the blood moon, right? It's so uh, invigorating in a way. The difference with this kind of phenomenon is that we can predict them. 
So when it comes to supernova eruption, within a couple of hundreds of thousands of years, which kind of blows our minds in their little kind of hundred year lifespan, right? Um, and if somebody tells you, oh, it's happening any time now, quote unquote, within cosmic, uh, cosmic um, time scales, you wish you would witness it. It's something that no one has ever seen before, right? It's yeah, this, this idea of a real time sadly extends to a 700 year time span. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. So, well, real time, we, again, in astronomy, we we're looking at the past, right? So, whatever we're looking at uh, Betelgeuse right now has happened 700 years ago. It happened to, yeah. Is it known if that's Betelgeuse as any planet? Uh, is this uh, known by the astronomical community? It's not known. We don't really know that, that. We know that Betelgeuse has not had any detected companions. We don't know of any detected companions, pl planets or smaller stars or any other, anything else. Yeah, they could be there. We just haven't detected. Yeah, although Betelgeuse is a, a supergiant, right? And it's a, a massive star, so it evolved really fast. So if it had any planets nearby... Uh, the initial object, the object that became the giant, uh, yeah. then they're completely swallowed. And then if it has planets further out, more power to them. I don't know. <laughs> they're going to witness a supernova in a much more dramatic way. Right. It's really not that old a star. It's actually a fairly young star. It's about 8 million years old. So. Yeah. Which compared to the sun is a, a baby. Oh, yeah. It's a baby. Yeah. yeah. So massive. Uh, the lifespan is short. The bigger they are, right? Yeah. I believe right. The shorter the lifespan. Correct. So they're like cars. The bigger cars consume their fuel much faster than my little beetle. <laughs> so, will that the, how we look at it? Will that change if uh, Betelgeuse became a supernova? Oh yes. Oh my goodness. Uh, there are some. Um, this one say triggered a lot of people's imagination. There are some little movies on Twitter if you find them uh, that showcase how Beetle how bright Beetlejuice will be, and it will be a source of light pollution. I can tell you that. I mean, the night sky it will be much brighter than the full moon. It's going to be you will be able to read a newspaper under Beetlejuice in the in the night sky. So, okay. what will that happen to Orion then? Will that uh, also become completely white. Uh, different, wiped. Yeah. We, we won't be able to see anything. It will be like trying, the other stars of Orion will look like, you know, fireflies right next to a big spotlight. We won't be able to see much. So the, our night sky will be different yeah, for like a couple of years. Moons, the moons in the sky, I mean, when we have a full moon, if it, it will be like, well, uh, from uh, different locations. I guess. Two moons in the sky. Well, if the moon ever goes into Orion? Uh, I remember my astronomy. <laughs> I, I don't remember. think it does get all that. It gets into Taurus. Close-ish. Yeah. Uh, does it? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Is there any object that uh, we can say during our lifetime, as we speak, so this uh, century, let's say, has uh, changed dramatically? Yes. <laughs> the question is which one, right? Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> well, um, there are different types of variable stars, stars whose brightness is changing. Uh, and there are some that uh, explode in a non-catastrophic way that are called novae. So our observers have been observing nova eruptions for, for tens of years now. And they're working with professional astronomers alongside trying to understand uh, what uh, the physics behind an, a nova eruption is um, using actually not only our ground-based uh, observations, but also space-based observations. Um, so these are pretty much stellar indigestions where one star is trying to cannibalize its uh, companion. It can't handle the material on its atmosphere and then it throws it up. Uh, here's a disgusting analogy for you. Um, but it's, um, we do see this kind of phenomena within the variable star world. Um, again, uh, we can't predict a supernova, which is a complete catastrophe of the star. Um, and we, we don't have models 
that are accurate enough to point towards a specific source and say, this is going to become a supernova tomorrow within, you know, our own little uh, lifetime. We can make the predictions within, again, hundreds of thousands of years, which is not helping anyone. But this is what we have. And that's why, you know, we keep observing. We keep trying to capture this kind of, of phenomena and understand where they come from. Would it be a possibility that uh, with the, the advancement in, in technology that uh, we could uh, narrow this, uh, the range of uh, the, um, you know, the prediction accuracy on when a star? You know, those predictions are based on data. So technology itself by itself is not going to help you. What's going to help you is you get more data. You try to understand the underlying physics and then you study the, the rest of the universe. You say, okay, based on what we understand, this star and this star and this star will do A, B or C. But having said that, again, everything is, is based on, uh, on data. On observations and it's not only for supernova eruptions right it's uh, for planet formation it is for eclipsing binaries it is for pulsating variables it is for stellar atmospheres it's for dark matter dark energy i mean anything and everything we have in uh, in astronomy including our solar system how the sun works and we've been observing this star through a telescope for 400 years now, right? Galileo was the first one yes. who discovered spots. And we still don't understand the, the details of its cycles. Right. right? So it's uh, things like that. Trying I mean, to understand our, our universe. This is where astronomers come in. Your instruments and observatories can only, can only do so much. In Once you have uh, observed, then uh, there's... Pretty much uh, from the engineering standpoint, you've exhausted your what you can do, right? I guess you have to look at the pattern, the empirical pattern. That's what's going to tell us the, the history. I guess. You have to look at the pattern. That's very true. Uh, the interesting thing with astronomy is that it drives technology um, evolution very frequently. I mean, just think about it. Wi-Fi was discovered by astronomers when they wanted to just transfer their data, big data sets. Um, so when it comes to trying to understand the universe, not just the pure science part that is driving um, progress, it's also the, the need of the community to actually do more and look at the universe in a different way that is actually driving technology as well. That's why astronomy has always been at the forefront of technological advancement. And that's why it's really very important and very applicable to our everyday life to actually keep asking questions, although most of the time we're not asking the right questions, uh, but keep asking questions. We're getting to the, towards the right direction and try to build the technology that we need to answer them because you know those, those technological applications are pretty much the seeds of what we have every day in our, um, in our disposal, right? Right. And now, your organization contributes a lot to that data, as we've already mm -hmm. talked about a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give us an overview of sort of how someone who's maybe got some skills as an astronomer has has a modest sized telescope or some other type <clears> of equipment <throat> can make that contribution actually become a citizen scientist? Like that? Absolutely. And actually, I can tell you how someone who has absolutely nothing in their disposal, they're just barely interested to get started, can actually get started. Because okay. actually, our, our organization prides of taking citizens who are interested from zero to contributing observations. Uh, we have a lot of training material for observers, from manuals to online courses, to mentoring, to workshop, to a very active help desk to help individuals uh, understand how to make contributions uh, in terms of observing variable stars with whatever means they have. And they have just a DSLR camera, you know, one of those cameras that you use. Yeah, I've uh, got your, two or three of them. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Take pictures of flowers and of, of trees and of your family during yeah. vacation. You can definitely use it to take data, astronomical data. Um, we uh, have uh, observing sections that have very up-to-date information on different types of variable stars. So you will learn a little bit more what they are, why they're important, how they work, what a light curve is to begin with, right? Uh, which is our, our, bread, our, our main tool to study the night sky. And by the way, a light curve is simply a recording of a brightness variation with time. That's all there is. It's the same thing as when you, if you have kids and you're recording their height with time, right? 
right. that's what we do with stars, record their brightness with time. That's all we are, we are recording. Uh, we also have, uh, we are the ones who are actually recommending different targets of interest because there are billion stars in the night sky. How do you know which one is interesting? Uh, and we have different ways of actually communicating that to our observer community, uh, depending on where they are in, on the planet and what kind of means they have in their hands. We have software for data analysis and reduction. We have lots of individuals who want to do their own projects. Um, and these are from your next door neighbor who wants a project for their retirement, to a teacher who wants projects for her students, to a professor who wants projects for her students, to a, to a student who wants projects for their own astronomy club, uh, for a science fair or something like that, to, of course, anyone who's interested in analyzing data themselves. Uh, we also have a journal that publishes uh, scientific outcomes. Uh, this is a referee journal. Uh, so it is a journal that is actually priding of um, publishing correct science and it's open to anyone. You don't have to be a professor at a university. You don't have to be connected with the research institute to publish there. Um, we are doing data quality control. One of the things that we found is that even the most experienced observer occasionally can submit discrepant data. And it has nothing to do with the observer. It may have to do with the software they're using, you know, some glitch in the software, some glitch in the software for their telescope, something is recorded wrong. Things happen, right? Especially sure. in the technology world. So we make sure that the data that are being submitted to our databases are being checked. And of course, we are maintaining the databases. So other than the uh, the photometry database, now we have a new spectroscopy database. Um, oh, yeah. We have, yeah, we have an exoplanet database for exoplanet follow-up. We have uh, the variable star index. It's a super catalog of information and variable stars. We have lots of databases like that. So this is something that is a, a resource for those who want to learn a little bit more about variable stars, see what kind of data exists. So going back to your beginning, if somebody wants to get started, all they need to do is contact us, avso at avso.org. We are, we are there to help. Um, and we can provide targets for beginners and targets for intermediate observers and targets for advanced observers. And let me actually say that Betelgeuse is a target for advanced observers. It's a difficult object to observe, believe it or not, because it's too bright. Ah, yeah. It's, uh, it's one of those interesting stars that uh, professional astronomers can't observe simply because it's too bright for big telescopes. And non-professional astronomers, our observers, need to be careful when they're observing it because the comparison stars are tricky. I see. Yeah. It's almost counterintuitive because one would think that, uh, you know, something that is so popular, it's so visible on the, at the naked eye, uh, it would be, you know, easier, but in reality, it's quite the opposite, I guess, right? Yeah, it's extremely difficult. And if not anything else, this is an example where small telescope, DSLR cameras, even photoelectric photometers that don't really exist anymore, but they're being maintained by some of our observers, make very unique contributions to science. You can't observe Betelgeuse any other way. If you have a, a, a big telescope, by the time you open the shutter, it saturates. Forget about it. You have to actually play games with special filters or defocusing or, you know, you're wasting your big telescope time uh, trying to observe Betelgeuse. So our observers with their small telescopes and spectrographs, with their uh, DSLR cameras are making very unique contributions trying to understand this phenomenon. This is what actually makes me very proud about these individuals. They're, they're doing their best and they're providing very unique data sets here. Hmm. Can I just go back for a moment to the supernova possibility? Yes. <laughs> Should this, this happen during our lifetime? So what would be the clues, the really clear clues that this is happening? How would people be able to experience this event in real time? So how many days or weeks or months or, I don't know, years, whatever would that take? How would we witness this amazing event visually? There, are, there is one telltale, I guess, um, right before a star becomes a visual supernova source, and that is neutrino, um, that neutrino detection that emerged from the inside of the stars. It, it reaches the final um, decay processes to reach iron. But what we're going to see is something, depending on whether you are, it's nighttime or daytime, right? 
if this happens during your nighttime, you will see a star that is actually a nice little red dot, kind of brightening, 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 and then becoming really bright. So depending on your perception, please don't think it's a UFO. It's not a UFO. It's just a beautiful phenomenon that is happening in your night sky. And it's very identified. <laughs> and it's not flying anywhere. Um, if you are in a daytime and suddenly night comes, you will see something extremely bright polluting your night sky, like a big, big spotlight um, in your night sky and wondering what it is. So let's see. So I have a question for you guys. Okay. What do you think will be the reaction of people after supernova goes kaboom, after Beetlejuice goes kaboom? Obviously aliens. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, obviously, but besides that, uh, well, you know, I think that, that uh, of course, everybody will want to go out and see it, but the most, uh, I can just imagine the headlines now, and people will be worried about the end of the world, and, and uh, you know, the gods are angry with us, but uh, <laughs> by and large, I think it'll just, it'll be similar to an eclipse and sent to you know, the public interest and, and how people will respond. Uh, you know, of course, we can predict the eclipse. They can plan months, of, years ahead of time. But uh, um, for this, it will just be all you have to do is step outside. Assuming it's the right time of year, you might have to get up early in the morning or uh, to see it, but uh, depending on the time of year. But it's kind of it, interesting. Uh Sorry for for interrupting, Paul. It was kind of interesting because talking about all of this because uh, I would actually, seriously speaking, I wonder if there are certain population in more isolated places on Earth where there's no much in terms of uh, you know communication and access to scientific information. Where maybe some tribes, some populations might might really not understand this phenomenon and really panic to a certain extent. Or at the minimum, give some theological explanation to it. I mean, I'm not saying it's uh, it's be widespread panic, but there might be some pockets here and there right. where it's possible. I would well, think. But even in our Western civilization, there might be some accounts, written accounts or paintings that maybe testify of some previous uh, supernova explosions. Um, are you aware of any of those, or even in the indigenous? Artworks, for example, there might be some examples that uh, show already something happened in the past. Yes. Well, there. I'm thinking when when a rocket uh, rocket ex uh, not explodes. What well, I'm thinking about yesterday. That's why I said explode. <laughs> but uh, when a rocket, um, uh, you know, even sometimes uh, some of the launch, more spectacular launches that happen in the morning, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, you see that. I've I've seen story of people that don't understand that that's a rocket launch starting to make all kind of speculation. Even for something as popularly known as a rocket launch, you know, there's schedules all everywhere. There's news and information everywhere. There's still some people, and I'm not talking about in in some isolated island in the middle of the Pacific. But I'm talking about people in, in the United States that literally don't know what happened, and they say, "Wow, what's that? You know, what is it a UFO? Is it a, some other phenomenon?" Oh, yeah, they, they'll. Oh. I'm sure there'll would, be every every possible combination of those. I wouldn't things. be surprised if <laughs> some people don't un, not understanding what's happening. Or <laughs> there, there could be panic because they think they're the Earth is threatened by this. Uh, right. 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 Now, if it were closer, it would be a threat. If it were closer, it would be a threat. I think that this is the the value of discussions like the one that we're having right now, yeah. popularizing science and answering people's questions like, what will happen if it'll just go kaboom? Will it be dangerous? The answer is no. It won't be dangerous. It will be bright. It will be pretty or ugly, whatever you your preference is about a light source in the night sky, but it won't affect the earth. There, It won't affect our atmosphere. It won't cause mutation. Radiation is not going to hit us and kill us or anything like that. Uh, so having active discussions around this kind of phenomena and try to explain to as many people as possible what they are, um, what the ramifications, quote unquote, are for life here on Earth and how pretty they're going to be and how excited we should be to be able to witness something like that. Because it's a once in a in anyone's lifetime phenomena, right? We're going to be part of history if you think about it. 
uh, it's really very important. So when you're talking about the outcomes of, of explosions that don't have, um, that, that panic people, um, I think that more information is needed, as simple as that, so that people demystify yeah. things like that. Information and education. That's, that's what Information you... education. Again, this is, again, the value of citizen science in general. It, you engage citizens to what you're doing so that they don't think it's magic to begin with. And actually, the power of citizen science is also the fact that without those citizens, without those well, individuals, huh? we can't we cannot do this kind of science. So you have a group of really highly educated, very motivated, you know, um, excited individuals helping professional astronomers, being collaborators to science. How can, so, how can we remove this entire halo of, uh, how can I put it? There's, there's a halo of, uh, of uh, an accessibility of dryness that... Uh, the, the the common man that it sees uh, in the scientific community, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, let's face it, there's a lot of uh, skepticism, there's a lot of lack of trust, not from people like us, you know, that understand and follow science on, on a daily basis and work in the science with the scientific community, but you know, there's a lot of people out there that still see that um, have difficulties even being able to to approach, you know, what I'm what I'm getting at. So, what do you think could be some of the ways that we can try to make science more accessible to people that still perceive science as something dangerous, something scary. I, don't know. <laughs> I think that we all perceive something as uh, scary or inaccessible when we don't know about it. It's exactly what you said. The reason uh, why Beetlejuice is not something magic for me and you is because I know some basics about that star, right? But if you show me something I do not understand and it's very close to my home and I will see it as a threat, then I will be scared about it. Um, and it doesn't really matter if I'm a scientist or not. It matters that I just don't know anything about it. So I think, again, that popularizing, discussing, putting science in front of individuals, people are smart. That's why we've evolved to be uh, on this planet and do what we're doing. Um, if you bring information in front of individuals and have the patience to translate it in a way that um, everybody will understand, uh, then you will have a very powerful support group around you, understanding and discussing science. It's really exciting. It's like a big party. Um, I think that scientists for a long time were considered to be a very exclusive group of individuals who speak a different language, completely different jargon. Uh, and I think that if not anything else, this century, things have changed. People, scientists are much more open to discussing their results. They realize that, you know, uh, everything that we do is taxpayer funded. So everyone has the right to uh, to participate and it's our obligation to translate it in ways that people can understand. And it's becoming more and more prominent, especially within the scientific community to make an, an, an effort to explain to people that, yeah, we have gravitational wave detection and it's a smashing of two neutron stars, right? Yeah, we have Beetlejuice uh, deeming, but there's nothing magic about it. Um, there are possibilities it will become a supernova, but not because of this particular phenomena. This deeming might be these two cycles overlapping. Just yeah. So um, and, and more scientists being willing to to discuss uh, in podcasts and social media. So I think that it's just a matter of information, nothing else. And, you know, think about you know. Um, I am Greek, so I, I come from a a background that has a long history of decide, of, of connecting science with paranormal phenomena back in antiquity, right? The gods are not happy with us, so they're taking the moon away. Here's a lunar eclipse. So when people demystified that, it became a phenomenon that everybody enjoyed, right? Nothing to be afraid of. So I think that we are on the right track, as simple as that. I'm very optimistic. It's important also to have... Um... Correct me if I'm wrong. Of course, from your expert standpoint, it's important also for a lot of people to to um, to see the connection to the to the day to day life. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people perhaps um, think, um, you know, how does this affect me on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. And without necessarily seeing that, uh, understanding the universe, understanding what happens in the universe, it's also important to understand how we can, uh, you know, go day to day. Um, in our lives, you know, I think that in a, in, in a way everything is connected together and our understanding in the universe 
gives us also a meaning to understand our own lives. I mean, that's for me, and I cannot speak for everyone, but I, I guess some people don't see that connection. Maybe necessarily they don't, they, they, I don't know. Maybe that's, that's one explanation that I have why some people are maybe perhaps turned off um, a little more than others. I don't know. Yes, and I think that it is our, again, our responsibility as scientists to actually make this connection for people, not expect them to understand just cause. Um, so, again, keep the discussion open. Keep the questions open. I don't know if you have any questions from your audience right now, Paul. Said Not positive. yet. No. Uh, wow, a few more minutes for questions. Our, like I said, this is our first live question session, and it's a work day for a lot of people. So I'm not surprised we don't have a big audience. Uh, if there's anybody out there who has a question, I'll even get it on, take it on YouTube or Discord or Twitter at Podcast Wow. So we were talking earlier about what if um, other generations before ours experience such an event as an, a supernova explosion or so some astronomical event that they could not explain uh, scientifically or in any other way, right? Uh, but. Uh, other than mythology, for example, or which I still find really fascinating, by the way. Um, so I'd be curious to hear um, uh, what you you know about this, because you just say that it, there are examples, such examples. Right. So there are, in, in human recorded history, there have been mentions of bizarre phenomena, right? Uh, Nove have been... Um, recorded by the ancient Chinese for the first time as a, a new star. Um, Al Gol as a, a binary star system is being mentioned in the Cairo calendar, ancient in Egypt, as something that has a periodicity of 2.8 days. So ancient Egyptians 3,000 years ago knew that there was a, a binary, so a thing, a thing. They didn't necessarily know it was a binary. And ancient Chinese didn't necessarily know that it was a, a nova, like a or a supernova, whatever bright star. Um, as you mentioned, there are lots of indications from paintings of uh, celestial phenomena that just ha that that imp left an impression with the artist and somehow made it into their paintings. So we see things that look like comets, for example, that are not recorded in human history. It's 12th and 16th century. Uh, paintings. Uh, I can't give you specific examples right now because they're not, I can't bring them on the top of my head. But what I know is that um, this kind of phenomena always fascinated people and they somehow incorporated them in their culture, somehow incorporated them in their written culture when they could. And even those petroglyphs occasionally showcasing things with rays and tails, you know, that look like I know stars, or they look like exploding stars that you find occasionally, maybe actually depictions of this kind of experiences. Um, we we can't um, we, we can't date them accurately, so that we can't go back and trace them. Uh, but occasionally, there have been connections of uh, of uh, supernova, for example, with their remnants, right? Tycho's uh, Kepler supernova, Tycho's supernova. There have been uh, records from 500 years ago that go back and point to the nebula that we see now. So it will be very interesting to see if anyone has made like a concentrated effort to record all this phenomena and you know talk about ancient. Um, transient sky astronomy uh, and uh, present it to the public. I would be very interested to read a paper like that or a book like that, if it, if it exists. So let me know if you, if you find one. Okay. I have a question, please, mm -hmm. um, for Stella. Um, talking about variable stars in general, um, and of course, uh, I'm not an expert by any stretch of imagination. <laughs> As a matter of fact, knowing that uh, we were going to be on the show today, <laughs> I went and spent half an hour on Wikipedia yesterday. <laughs> and, um, and I noticed one of the things that, that, uh, I, that uh, you know, struck me was uh, how many different types, how, how vast is the, the, uh, the, you know, the, the field of uh, types of, of, of variable stars, right? We have so many different types mm -hmm. of variable stars. And uh, what it seemed to have occurred to me and one of my questions that came up was, it seemed almost like, to me, it almost seems like every star is variable to one degree or another. And, and it seemed to me that uh, variability is more a matter of degree, right, than uh, 
so I guess get, coming to my question is, my question is, there are stars that are not classified as variable, to my understanding. They're, they're I don't know, I guess constant star is the right term. So what is the, um, I don't know if I'm formulating the question correctly or not, but what would be the threshold? What would be the, the, the defining factor? What are, what are the metrics to, to, this, to, to, um, you know, to classify a star as variable or non-variable? It's an excellent question. Uh, a star in our nomenclature, in our world, is variable as, lo as long as you can observe variability from the ground, from here, from the Earth. Uh, even with space, you know, one of the things that we learned from the Kepler mission is that to a point, every single star in the night sky can't be changing with time. Uh, so variability, uh, as far as we're concerned here at the AVA, so in most astronomy, right, uh, is something that you can detect, uh, where you can detect a change in the brightness of the star from the ground. Now, something, as you mentioned, something is variable with respect to something else that is constant. How do you define a constant star? You have to remember our detection abilities are not infinite. We can't, from the ground, we cannot measure change in the brightness of the star down to millimagnitudes simply because of our technology limitations. So if the accuracy with which you can observe a, a star's brightness is a hundredth of the magnitude, right, then everything under that is noise. So then everything that is variable, that is changing in brightness within uh, for more than a hundredth of a magnitude is variable, right? And of course, it depends on what kind of means you're using. Excuse me. If you're using your eyes, our eyes are less sensitive than a digital image that you can stretch and you can, you can play with. So with your eyes, you can uh, detect variability typically down to a tenth of a magnitude. Right? Well, I have some very, very talented observers who actually can detect variability with their eyes and a big telescope down to, to actually um, 5% of a magnitude, which is like blows my mind. These Very are people good, yes. <laughs> who are super talented. They're not professional astronomers. They're, they're amazing individuals who can actually do that. And they've been doing that for, for decades, right? Detect variability of this kind of stars and provide all the excellent data that we have. Uh, but, you know, for a person like me who has tried uh, to do visual observations, a tenth of a magnitude is considered to be a big success. Yay, go me. <laughs> If you have a DSLR camera or a CCD camera, if you have more digital means, then you can do measurements a little bit more accurately, but you have to remember that you have to process your data and remove the electronic noise of your instruments, right? Uh, and there's and even the, uh, the read noise of your instrument, all kinds of noise sources that come from the, uh, the observing process. And that is introducing your error bar. That is telling you how, how detailed your measurement can be. So, yeah, although every single star in the night sky theoretically has some level of variability, it doesn't really mean we can observe them from the Earth. Right. Also, a star is constant until it starts doing something. <laughs> so <laughs> there have been instances where we're using uh, constant stars as comparison stars. Where we have been using certain constant stars for... Um, decades, and suddenly one of those starts doing something that is way above the noise. And you're like, oh, okay, then I guess you're not a constant star anymore. So these are the most challenging cases because we have to go back and calibrate all the light curves and all the data that have been submitted using that particular star as a constant star. But now I'm getting into details. Um, did I answer your question? Yes, yes, definitely answered my question. I really yes. appreciate that. That's uh, it's, it's very fascinating. Uh, it is, isn't it? It is kind of a, it's a difficult thing because really the way you measure brightness of a star is by comparing it to stars that don't vary in brightness, right? Mm -hmm. And that have been carefully calibrated. Yes. Uh, now we should mention that something like the Kepler Space Telescope measured brightness down to exquisitely low noise level, but you have to be in space to with a very expensive instrument to do that yeah and yeah. you have this thing here that is called the earth's atmosphere that for better or worse is messing up with our observations but it's a, a blessing for humankind right, right. what yeah. wouldn't be able to be here and breathe and have this discussion so 
uh, at some point you are, you know, again, it's a comparative science. Right. And we're trying to actually do the best with the means that we have in our hands. Right. Well, I think you guys do a wonderful job. Uh, and uh, I look at your data almost every day. And, Me too. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the, um, by the way, uh, I should let the audience know that Stella was on about three and a half years ago on the podcast to talk about Boyaji and Star, which we yes. called Tabby Star at the time, uh, yeah. and what what her team was doing to monitor that. They still are monitoring that star. Uh, yep. Although right now, this time of year, it's a really bad time of year to, to be looking at it, and only people way up north can see it. But uh, the um, I just checked. I just checked this morning, and there was more data from Belgium, which is, you know, pretty far north. Uh, but anyway, uh, thanks a lot, Stella. Uh, the hour has flown by, and uh, we appreciate it. And you are you have the honor of being our very first Wow Signal Live guest. Uh, Wonderful. We've been Thank doing all so these pre-recorded before. Now wow. this will, th uh, I'll I will take the audio from this and make it into an audio podcast. Uh, and I will uh, let you know when that's out available. Uh, it should Sounds be a day or two. Uh, Sounds and, great. And uh, so uh, I'd like to also thank uh, Daniela. Thank you, Paul. Thank you to everyone for the really interesting conversation. I've learned a lot. Thanks. And Chiro. Thank you, Paul. It was a pleasure to uh, to meet uh, Stella and a pleasure to to see Daniela again, of course. Now, I think this is actually officially the first time Chiro's been on the WOW signal. Yeah, I think so. Uh, but uh, he was on the Unseen, unseen podcast. Yeah. Our, that's, our, right. our, that's why nobody saw us, but Paul, because it was Unseen. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, welcome to the WOW signal. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. And hope to have Pleasure. you back. Pleasure. And, uh, so anyway. So, can I say one last thing? Sure. The uh, Beetlejuice light curve is evolving. Every day our observers are submitting new data. So if any of your um, audience, anyone from your audience wants to keep following it um, and even look at it through the AVSO observers, www.avso.org. You can actually plot a light curve and see what it's doing every day. Yeah, and I, I, I do that, and I can tell you it's very easy. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you just type in Beetlejuice. If you, if you don't spell it wrong, it'll come. <laughs> you'll get the light curve. <laughs> or Alpha Orionis. Brightest Alpha Orionis, yes. Alpha okay. Ori, yeah. So you okay. can do either or. Yeah, and, and and if you are interested in in working with Stella's organization to become a variable star observer, go to the same website aavso.org. Absolutely, and, and you and can actually you become a member. Uh, it's only eighty five dollars a year, and you're supporting a great citizen science organization. Or you can just if you have any questions, aavso um, at aavso.org. Just send us an email. Yeah, just and uh, sure. you can also adopt a star, right? And adopt the star. Oh, you can adopt villages. Yeah, you can adopt any star uh -huh. you like that they observe, and uh, yeah. it's I, it's not eighty five dollars a year, something else, but it's it's, it's like thirty dollars. Thirty dollars a year, and yeah. uh, it helps it helps the organization, uh, and it um, keeps the lights on at AAV. So, and Sounds good. Uh, anyway, thanks so much, Stella. We may have you back in a couple of years to <laughs> tell talk about, about something so, else. Some, something else that's flickering in the sky. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you. To, thank you. The rest of you. And this will be. This will conclude this uh, this live stream portion of our program. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Well, once again, I'd like to thank Stella Kafka, as well as our panelist Chiro Villa and Daniela DiPaldis for joining us on the very first Wow Signal Live. Now, we're going to be doing more of these. There have been some announcements that have gone out earlier. The idea is to have a panel and often, uh, probably usually, a, a special guest like Stella, and then uh, the audience can participate live through either the YouTube chat or through Discord or even Twitter. And you can get your comments in that way. And 
So we hope that will will be happening quite a lot more over. Well, I'd like to do about six or seven of them this year, and then maybe more in 2021. And if you're a Patreon subscriber, you will not be billed for Wow Signal live per se. But uh, if this does turn into a full episode, as it usually will on the audio feed, then yes, Patreon subscribers will be billed their usual per episode amount every time we do one of those. However, uh, as usual, the Patreon subscribers will get the audio before anyone else, uh, typically, unless there's something really breaking that we need to get out. Now, this is all in addition to our regular episodes and bursts that will be coming out when they're ready. We don't have a regular release schedule and don't plan to have one, but we will be doing that sort of thing every uh, many times this year in 2020. We'll have quite a few interviews. We have one coming up that's planned very soon, and there's there are more um, in the oven, so to speak. So we'll hope to see you then. If you have any questions about the podcast, please feel free to contact us. You can email wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com. You can comment directly on our blog at podcast wow at uh, sorry at wowsignalpodcast.com uh, podcast wow is our twitter handle and we also have a as we mentioned a discord server you can get on there and comment anything about anything you like and um, I have yet to kick anybody off that server so so far so good um, just let us know what you think the other option is our subreddit, which is pretty much a ghost town, but I would not have any objection to somebody going on there and starting up a lively conversation. So, uh, now you'll notice one other thing. Uh, since this is the first WoW Signal Live, I thought I would experiment a bit with the music. The, uh, the music that introduced the show and that will conclude the show is by Argentinian composer Claudio Nunez, who I found on the Free Music Archive. So it is Creative Commons. Uh, the, there's also a little bit of piano music there by Maurice Ravel, the famous French composer, and it was played by Philippe Sara. And so I thank those guys, and hopefully we will be you'll be hearing a lot of new music on the show. And uh, just we're just experimenting, and, and we'll we'll use the Wow Signal Live format to keep introducing new music, and maybe someday we'll settle on something that's just perfect. Uh, well, perfect doesn't really happen, but something that's really seems really suitable, and uh, for introducing the show, and also uh, maybe some fresh bumpers as well, and. Uh, like that little bit of piano music, I thought that was pretty nice. Um, so I'd appreciate it very much if you would subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast aggregator, whether that's iTunes or whatever it, it is. Uh, we're on pretty much all of them, or will be very soon. We, um, we're also available on YouTube, by the way. Uh, we All the episodes, audio only, will go to YouTube. And uh, you can listen there if you prefer. But leave us comments and a rating. If you're listening on YouTube, leave us a thumbs up if you if you can, and subscribe, and that will help us get the word out. The other thing I'd like to mention is if you want to support the show, uh, go to Patreon.com/slash/WowSignal, and I would like to thank all those who have so far done that, and your money will go to good use to support the podcast. The expenses of the podcast um, are there's an ongoing set of expenses, plus there are things we'd like to get done if we have more funds. And that would include buying equipment for some of our co-hosts and also travel to conferences, that sort of thing. So by all means, um, feel free to go over there. I will let you know what we're going to do with your money, and I will give you early previews on the content that's coming out. And if there's any other perks you think you might be interested in as a Patreon supporter, by all means, get in touch and we'll see what we can do. Um, 
You can also, by the way, you can buy t-shirts for the podcast at uh, Cafe Press. There's a link at the website at wowsignalpodcast.com. So thank you once again, Stella Kafka and the panel and the musicians. And we will see you on episode 45 before too much more time has expired. This has been The Wow Signal, a podcast produced by the Dream of the Open Channel. Please visit wowsignalpodcast.com for more information. All music presented on this podcast is either Creative Commons or is presented with the permission of the artist. The Wow Signal is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike License.